everybody. I'm Jack Belcher. I'm the Chief Information Officer in Arlington County, and I welcome you all here tonight for this next in the series of discussions about our digital destiny. I, uh, people are coming in, so I'm really pleased that you all are here. I want to note a few people who are here, though, that are important to uh, recognize. We have Karen Graff is here, and Karen's the uh, Arlington Co is part of the Alexandria School Board. And uh, Karen, you want to just step and say hello? She's here, and I appreciate you being here, Karen. Lisa Guernsey is here. She's the Deputy, Deputy Director of Education Policy for New America Foundation. She's co-author of a book called Tap, Click, and Read, so we thank her. Uh, I want to thank my boss, Mark Schwartz, is here someplace. I saw him. There he is. All right. He's here. And also Diane Crash for co-sponsoring this with me tonight, and I really appreciate it. So uh, I'm not going to spend too much time talking. I want to get to the discussion. But uh, we're entering an age of extraordinary times, uh, exponential growth in technology. It's affecting us in every way imaginable, how we work, how we live, how we, how we communicate with each other. Much of it is going to be very, very good, but there's some aspects of it that we really have to take a moment, step back, and say, what does it mean for us? And is, is it all about technology? So before I move on, I want to also recognize Jim Schwartz. Uh, Deputy County Manager who's just joined us as well. So I'd like to ask Libby Garvey to come on up here and uh, to take the microphone, and Libby will introduce Christian Dorsey after that. So thank you, Libby. Oh, thank you so much, Jack, and I'll be, I'll be really quick. It's, it's great to be here to see you all. I got to be here for the, uh, it was actually not in this building, it was in a different library. Thank you very much to our libraries um, to do the first Digital Destiny, and I think these conversations are so important. I've been hosting a series of, of book clubs, and I was thinking, um, you know, I was on the school board for 15 years, so this particular issue was really important to me. Um, I think it's important to all of us, and it's wonderful that we have Tanya Talento here, our newest school board member, which is great. And I, the, the book that I first started with it was called Brain Rules, and that was actually how we learn. And it was, you know, examining how does the how does how do humans work? And I think that's what we're going to talk about here. And how does it intersect with technology? One of the things I realized when I read that book is how much these little devices meet most of the brain rules. But of course, not all of them, because we're still social animals. We need to talk. We need to be together. There's a whole balance here between technology and learning, and I am really looking forward to the discussion, um, and I'm looking forward to learning some things myself and getting some insights from our panelists, from questions here, and then there are folks at home, I think, who may be sending in some questions online as well. So I'm looking forward to the discussion, and now I'd like to welcome uh, Christian Dorsey, my colleague on the county board, to say a few words. And uh, Christian, you're armed with your, uh, your device here, too. Armed with my technology. Thank you, Libby. And uh, good evening everyone and, and thank you all for being here tonight both for the in-person crowd and for what I think is probably an exponentially larger number who are watching online on Facebook Live. I uh, really appreciate you all being here because this is a, a topic and issue that really warrants community conversation. Doesn't just require that we check in after things change but that we kind of have an ongoing process to think about digital destiny within the various ways in which we deliver programs and services and opportunities in our community. And I'm particularly interested in the intersect of uh, digitizing our world and what it means for learning and learning opportunities. And as I think about this, I think about it from the uh, perspective of a board member, but also a parent and also a user of technology. And when I think about it from the perspective of being a board member, I am always cognizant that people think of Arlington in a way that reflects our commitment to valuing innovation in education. It's a key driver of why people move to our county, because of the opportunities that are available in public schools, our community colleges, the local universities that are a part of our consortium of, of educational opportunities for adults, and even our programs for lifelong learners. It's a key reason why people want to be here. And as we think about kind of how education at all of those levels has changed, it's been quite remarkable. And that's where my experience as a parent comes into play. I've got a third grader who uses one of these both in the classroom and at home. And it's remarkable to think that not all that long ago, probably less than five years, if we were to think about how my child would have dealt with uh, continuing her math education after the school hours. It would probably be with a, a static worksheet that was developed five, ten years ago in a book 
that would give her a limited number of opportunities to practice skills that were presented in the classroom. Now, she can come home, the worksheet is not static. It's dynamic. It can be populated with lots of different questions or lots of different problems. Those can be changed almost in an instant. And in fact, they can be adapted to her, her own learning style and the rate at which that she's absorbing the information. It's dramatically changed the ability to extend classroom learning for her. And when we think about digital technology writ large, it becomes even more remarkable. This, this meeting itself, how would it have worked a few years ago? You would have seen a flyer, perhaps in this library, perhaps in another civic building, or perhaps if you're part of a connected civic institution, there would have been a blurb in the newsletter. And maybe you would have decided to come, or maybe you just would have happened by. But today, all of that can take place digitally. In fact, you can make the decision that you want to come just by clicking your device. And then as the event <clears throat> nears, you probably got an automatic reminder telling you that it's coming up. On the day of the event, you were probably presented an array of options for how to get here, whether you wanted to walk, whether you wanted to use your own personal vehicle, or whether you wanted to use transit. And it probably told you what was the fastest way to get here and probably gave you a really good estimate of when you would arrive. It's amazing to think how far we've come with the availability of offerings and, and the prospects for education are just mind boggling. And I think it's just terrific that we can engage together to discuss what the future might bring, get a sense of some of the opportunities and really play a part in shaping Arlington's digital destiny. So before we begin, I'd just like to again acknowledge the forward thinking, the creative vision of Arlington's Chief Information Officer, Jack Belcher, and to thank our Director of Libraries, Diane Kresh, for convening this conversation. And I am gonna shut up and now turn it over to Holly Hartel, who's gonna get the conversation started. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate everybody being here. I want to point out as we're getting started into the nuts and bolts of this event, a couple of things. One, as we had mentioned before, it is being streamed, which is absolutely fabulous. So there is an at-home audience who can not only watch, but they can also participate in one of the breakout sessions that we'll be doing. But it also means that, one, you're okay with being on video, and also that we have a hard stop. So we have a hard stop at 8.30 so that those people who are at home will have the opportunity. So I wanted to make sure that everybody was aware of that. So we're talking about learning. And I want to also put this in a sense of context that, oh, I, I'm, I actually am I'm mic'd. Um, okay. I, I want to put this in a context that we are um, talking about learning and we're not just talking about K through 12. As Christian was talking about, we're talking about lifelong learning. We use the phrase K through gray and what that means is we're talking about uh, not only higher education and K, K through 12, but also those adult learners, those people who are coming back into the workforce, those people who might be looking to take an art class or something. There's so many different aspects of education, and as part of Arlington County is our responsibility to look out for all of them. Um, the other thing I want to just point out, we we're talking about the future. So there's been a lot of top, talk of uh, education in the news and the media recently. We're talking about 20 years out from now. We're talking about what are things going to happen, what's going to happen. Um, what we've done is, is very exciting. I want to introduce to you a very brief video. We worked with uh, students from the Arlington Career Center, fabulous group of students, who actually asked questions that align with some of the topics we're going to be talking about. And I want to kick us off by showing that video. So I'll step aside and I will let the video show. How to careers outside the classroom for me is a two experience. It's observation, it's understanding what's happening in the world around me. Para mí el aprendizaje ocurre de, de muchas maneras en la, en la comunidad. Saco a mis niñas al parque, las llevo al museo, hasta la experiencia de ir al mercado no es una experiencia de aprendizaje para ellas. Well, when I learn, I usually study in my room to like remember, I guess, and also use Quizlet sometimes. That sometimes I go to the library, the central library. I think learning for me occurs through social media, uh, YouTube, uh, just video outlets, online. I'm 
learning about different technologies that we can bring into, into classrooms or we can bring into schools in order to help students be more successful and plan for the future because we don't even know what's going to happen you know, later down the line. And so really it's a very exciting time, I think, for us um, in, in education. Bueno, yo uso la tecnología en mi día para aprender. Lo uso de buena manera, ¿verdad? Lo uso como para buscar también vocabulario o palabras que no sé para saber el significado que tienen. Well, that's the part that we try and help people with because we have a lot of resources that people can use. There's Library Press Display, which has a lot of newspapers at current day, so they have access to them from home. Any day that they want to look at, they can use them or if they want to do research. I guess some people may not be set up to have internet I and mean, offer some type of service um, that the school could pay for to some degree. I think um, people who are like older don't know the, like technology as well, so I think that maybe people could do like classes for like adults or elderly people to like learn how to use the internet. Technology is really important in like Arlington, so I think having like Wi-Fi would really help like around, around the area. Um, I know the library has some Wi-Fi, but um, maybe at like um, other community centers, stuff like that. Yeah, I, I think that really comes down to making sure that the resources that you look at are diverse and that, you know, if, if you get all of your information from one source, um, everybody has their own idea and their own perception of what happens and it's important to diversify what you're looking at so that you can be educated about all of the different possibilities um, in one particular area. It's really tricky because um, obviously people are interested in hearing what their friends and neighbors are passing around but you just need to make sure that you know whether it's news or not and I think that's why it is really important to make sure that you're using like a paid service like looking at the Washington Post or another newspaper or New York Times. So if you can't afford your own subscription, you can go ahead and use it through the library or your school to make sure you know what paid outlets are doing. Pues um, hay que chequear y doble chequear, no porque a veces la información que uno escucha en la noticia no necesariamente es 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 la realidad. Entonces hay que um, chequear con recursos que realmente tienen validez. opportunity to work with the students and Tom O'Day, the teacher, who um, helped organize them and, and put that together. I gave them a lot of free reign. I gave them some simple parameters. Um, we were talking about four different topics related to technology and learning. We're talking about gone as a traditional place for learning, gone as a traditional approach for learning, gone are barriers to knowledge, and gone is lack of access to information. And so they took that and that was what they developed. But it gives you a touch into some of the different areas and what some people's ideas are. Um, as before we go into talking with the different uh, facilitators, I want to introduce a little bit of why we're doing this and what we hope to get out of this. So as Jack introduced, there is a digital revolution that is happening. Life is changing before we know it. I, I, mean, I went back to an example when my first child was born and having to plug in my phone to get, or my computer to the phone system to get pictures. And some of you probably remember something different from that and how easy it is now just to take a picture on my phone and send a picture of my last daughter that was born. How quickly that has changed. Um, but making sure that everyone's aware that this is happening and we need to think about these things so that as a county, we can help in deciding where we think we want to go. What's also really important, there's a lot of fabulous people within Arlington, a lot of people who have professional experience and who have personal experience around the topic of learning. And we're trying to tap into that and hear from people and hear from people's ideas. What we're hoping to get out of this is not necessarily defining what the future is going to be, but understanding enough so that we can hopefully be developing guideposts and a set of principles that we can use to inform us when we're having those conversations. Um, so what I'd like to do is I'd like to introduce the facilitators who are helping us go through this. So we're lucky enough to have Diane Kresh from the Director of Libraries, Susanna Spellman, who is a Director of UCAN and uh, Internet2, School Board Member Tanya Talento, Howard Feldstein, who is the Director of the Arlington Employment Center, 
and Steve Kinney, who is a VP with um, Gartner. So I will let each of them introduce to you a little bit more about themselves and their, their take on the topic that they will be discussing, and then I will go into the breakout sessions and how those are going to work. Okay, great. Thanks, Holly. Can you, can you hear me? It's great to see so many familiar faces. I, I see a colleague from many, many years at the Library of Congress, so it, it, it's great. Whenever I look forward, I always have to look back first. So I'm going to bring us back to 1731 and Benjamin Franklin, who started the first public library and really basically began the foundational aspects of free and open access to information that we enjoy today. His library company of Philadelphia was a model for many other libraries in the early colonies. And from that very simple precept of getting together a group of friends and wanting to know more and buying books and then making them freely available has, has sprung the national system that we know today. So from Ben Franklin, we'll skip ahead about 150 years to Scottish immigrant Andrew Carnegie, who built some 2,500 to 3,000 libraries because he believed as a self-made millionaire, he had an obligation to share his wealth with others. So in the latter part of his life, he was known for his philanthropy. As I said, he built between 2,500 and 3,000 libraries here in the United States and around the world. There's a brilliant example of his library in DC. Uh, it's uh, the, uh, the, used to be part of the DC Public Library, but it's in that Penn Quarter area. And in a simple twist of fate, in about a year, it's going to be a flagship Apple store. So again, linking, linking knowledge and the capture of knowledge with technology, which is, our, which is our topic for this evening. To build on a couple of things that Christian was saying, I, I've been in the library profession for slightly more than 40 years. Uh, I got my library degree in 1909. So <laughs> clearly things have changed. And I remember card catalogs, and libraries were in the vanguard of institutions of learning that were taking the technology that was available and improving access to information. So we went from catalogs to online resources. We threw in microfilming so that we could, could preserve newspapers, and now we digitize. We had e-books. We make uh, uh, our, our resources freely available. We have laptops. We have all of that stuff. But none of it works without the people. So I want to make a little plug for, although technology is wonderful, we practice what I'll call high touch with high tech. And so we can't have one without the other, because we still have to be available to help navigate through all of the information sources that are available to us. And we all know from many, many current examples that becomes more and more complex as we're sifting between what is true and what is factual and what is something different. So we have lots of resources. I'd like to put in a plug for some of the new things that we're doing in the library. We believe that our role in the community is to take our resources to where the patrons are. And so this past year, we've experimented with a pop-up library in Crystal City, which is doing quite well. We also have been working with uh, experts in the community to have maker nights. I don't know if you're familiar with the maker, maker movement, but that's where bunches of people arrive in the library with piles of stuff and make things. And it can be as low tech as Legos, or it can be high tech as building computers with Arduino. So the point is learning happens in many traditional and untraditional ways. We're here with our experts and our spaces and our, our passion for what we do to help make it happen. So we look forward to the conversation this evening. Thanks. Hi there. My name is Susanna Spellman. I'm the executive director of the United States Unified Community Anchor Network, otherwise known as USUCAN. It's a part of Internet2. Internet2, for those of you who don't know, is a nonprofit organization that owns and operates a nationwide telecommunications backbone that's solely focused on education and research. In fact, 20 years ago, it was founded by leading research universities in order to be a platform for them to collaborate, have access to high computing centers, be able to do advanced research, connect to the Large Hadron Collider, et cetera. The program that I lead takes the Internet2 and research and education networks, these nonprofit education networks, to the next level, to K-12 schools, to libraries, to healthcare, public safety, um, state and local governments. So that's the group that I kind of represent within Internet, too. 
Um, in fact, through Connect Arlington, um, the schools and libraries will have access to Internet too through MARIA, which is the Research and Education Network out of Virginia, through its relationship with Virginia Tech. So on the other side, I come from the high tech side, less touch, but more high tech as compared to what mm -hmm. Diane talked about. But um, the section that I'm kind of focusing on and we're the yellow section over there is gone are the traditional approaches to learning. And we all know that technology has changed education and learning tremendously from being able to go online and learn about a topic on Wikipedia to being able to watch a video from Khan Academy to learn that advanced calculus um, concept that you never learned when you were in school 20 years ago, or to perhaps help your son or daughter learn that concept that you never learned 20 years ago. There's been things like MOOCs, the massively open online courses that are available. These are college courses that are available online for free. They don't come with credit, although they're working on that, but they are available for anyone to access, and they come in a range of topics from engineering to literature and classics. There's also new technology paradigms that are going on in the classroom called the flipped classroom. That is where students are told to go and learn on their own, usually checking on the iPad to learn about, you know, read an article or do a little um, online learning course, but then to come to the classroom prepared to talk. So it's a more of an interactive dialogue with the teacher versus the rote just teacher talking to the student. And it's putting a lot of the ownership on the student for learning, but the best way that that, teacher, that student has been able to learn generally is through technology. As we all know, kids can't do anything without, a life, without an iPad or a computer, et cetera. Also, one of the very interesting learning paradigms that are coming out there are using online gaming, like Minecraft, to help teach um, early primers in, um, in computer science, and also virtual reality. And these are all going to require a lot of bandwidth, massive amounts of bandwidth that Traditional telecommunication networks are just starting to be able to deliver, including the one that Arlington County has started to put together. Future, another item of the future in learning is social networking and being able to go onto an online classroom with other students from across the world, either at the K-12 level or at the gray level. But as we all know, the environment isn't perfect. A lot of high tech means a lot of low people touch and less interaction with others. And what does that mean for how students learn? Will they be able to learn in the traditional manners as well as in the non-traditional manner, which is the emerging education manner? That's something that we wanted to talk about a little bit in our, our session and also talk about what does technology really do to help us learn better? And what are some of the detriments to moving to such a digital or tech-focused learning platform? And then how do we ensure our human interaction and touch in the learning education as education moves to be more digital? Good evening, my name is Tanya Tuento. I am the, Arlington County, the newest Arlington County School Board member. And tonight we're going to be discussing God are the barriers to knowledge. And so what my topic is gonna to cover is even as technology becomes more affordable and internet access seems increasingly ubiquitous, a digital divide between rich and poor remains. The rich and educated are still more likely than others to have good access to digital resources. The digital divide has especially far-reaching consequences when it comes to education. For children, inadequate access to technology can hinder them from learning the tech skills that are crucial to success in today's economy. For adults, lack of access can prevent learning new skills necessary for a job or even applying for a job. What should happen to break this divide? And so I chose to facilitate this topic because I remember being a child in DC and my sister won a set of encyclopedias. Mm. So we had a set of Britannica encyclopedias in her house. Mm. And it wasn't until later that I realized that was my library, that was my knowledge base. Um, we were a low income family and I don't know what we would have done if I didn't have access to those in my house. Uh, when I was living in DC, I don't recall of a library being within walking distance and we all took public transportation. How would we have gotten there? What would that have done for my education if my sister hadn't won those encyclopedia sets? So what's gonna happen 10 years from now when Wi-Fi is accessible to everybody in our community? But now, what is that divide? Are the people with wealth able to purchase a faster internet speed? Will they have access to higher quality information sites? What kind of, how will that affect your news media? How will that affect your education source? What kind of tutorials will you get online? Will, just because we have free public Wi-Fi, will that mean that you can access it in your home with or without a device? 
Will our students be going to libraries who are low income while our students who are high income have it all over in every part of their home? It, these are the kinds of questions that I want to explore tonight with our group to figure out how we are going to make sure that divide doesn't grow and how maybe we can use this kind of technology to decrease it and really make education equitable as we grow in the digital destiny world. Thank you. Hi, I'm Howard Feldstein, and I'm the director of the Arlington Employment Center. And my topic is gone are the days where access to the internet was an issue. <laughs> but before I talk about my topic, I'm going to do a plug for where I work. If any of you out there are looking for employment, conducting a job search, or if you're an employer looking for qualified employees, please give me a call. In internet vocabulary, that was called a pop-up ad. <laughs> You know, every day now, the information that's loaded on the internet is stupendous. It's, it's mind-boggling. And this includes online coursework and other educational information. In addition, we have Google, YouTube, the ubiquitous Twitter, and other social networking platforms, all which present an educational environment for you or information that can be used for education. But let's not confuse access with learning. Because we really have to look at this wealth of information that's coming at us every evening or every morning. What is really valid for learning purposes? Not only the topics that are structured for education, but the general information that comes at us. How do we, and my question is, how do we best use this information for learning? How do we best teach young learners or old learners how to pick the wheat from the chaff, so to speak, the truth from the garbage that's out there? That's what I want you to think about tonight. Thank you. OK, well, uh, good evening. My name is Steve Kenny. Uh, I come from a company called Gartner. Gartner is the world's largest um, IT research and advisory company. We don't make anything, uh, nothing hard, uh, hardware, software. We produce research, objective research, and everything that we produce goes through an ombudsman, a third party. So we don't have a dog in the fight. I'm objective, uh, and our aim is to come in and ask those difficult questions. I have the best job in the room tonight because I'm in the digital community. Um, so you guys out there, we're going to have a great decision, a discussion on all these questions. I also have a disadvantage. I can see your body language. I already know what some of you are thinking. I can't see my digital community's body language, so I'm going to have to dialogue with them. It's a different form of dialogue that we'll be having. So I really look forward to it. Thank you for the invitation, um, and let's get going. Great. So I'm very excited um, to have her. So you, you've met the panelists. I'll have them go down to their areas now. So the way this is going to work, it's called it's a lightning breakout. So it, it's fast, not furious, but, but fast. We are going to be asking two questions. John, go ahead. Okay. You, um, we're going to be asking two questions about each one of the topics. We are going to spend about 10 minutes on each one of the questions. Very simple questions. The first question is, what are your ideas, images, words, of what this will look like in the future? So we're going to spend about eight minutes talking as a group of what you think that could look like in the future. And then at the very end, we're going to say, well, what, out of all the great things that you've heard, pick two that we want to delve into a little bit further. Once we go through the two, we're going to then start talking about what are the challenges to making those top two ideas a reality. And we'll spend eight minutes talking about the challenges related to those ideas. And then we're going to pick the top two. And then after that, as a group, we are going to share out and discuss what we've discussed. So it's going to happen really quickly. The idea is not to delve too far into all these great things. We don't have time for that in this event, but it doesn't mean that it can't happen in another place. But as many great ideas as we possibly can get out. So with that, I'll have my. Facilitators move to their areas. All right, so for the online community, the, uh, we're just breaking it out and going to our groups. I'll start talking to you about some of the comments. Thank you for the uh, compliments to the, uh, to the library Hello. and to the students. That was a great video. I uh, really enjoyed watching it. So let's have a discussion then. We've got the four questions that we're going to talk about. Uh, does anyone want online want to kick off and um, talk to um, one of the things that pops out most to them? Um, as the groups uh, go around in the background, you'll hear the noise, but um, you'll just be able to hear me primarily. I see some of the comments that are coming in. Um, so, uh, Adam, thank you for your compliments to the students uh, and to the career service as well. Uh, Pat, good to see you online. Um, what are we thinking right now in terms of these questions? 
Well, let me ask you a question. Of the, of the four areas that we're looking at, um, which one troubles you the most? Um, what way uh, causes you to think that this might not be the direction that we're going into, um, that clearly we have no choice but to go into? Um, we've already had legal concerns about access to digital information, the sharing of digital information. Uh, there's, uh, animate, uh, there's actual physical machines that are now connected, dro uh, drones for example, uh, both with uh, f uh, telescopic lenses as well as the internet connectivity. They can pass information. Are there any privacy, social, legal, ethical morals uh, that present red flags to you? I'm looking online at who we've got. Uh, Pat, hello there. Um, we've got Jenny. Welcome, Jenny. Um, thank you for the compliments. Uh, Matthew, uh, good to see you too. Actually, two Matthews. Jenna, um, thank you for the... Uh, uh, Adam, you were saying thanks for the great streaming uh, for those of us couldn't make it to the central library. But, you know, here's an example exactly of what the, uh, the digital divide can do. We can make and bring into your own t uh, onto your own laptops a, a discussion uh, and a moderated discussion, if you like, that provides value to you and that you don't have to actually be here. Um, you know, in the future, it's quite possible, I think, that actually the only people in this room will actually be the moderators uh, and the rest of us won't even come here anymore. Uh, we could even beam ourselves in virtually. Do you remember the Star Wars, uh, the 3D holograms, uh, Princess Leia coming out of R2-D2, I think it was? Um, you know, how, how credible is that for the future, that we could see Pat's uh, 3D um, uh, uh, image here? So around the room, we're broken into groups. Each group is examining a question with a moderator, and their task has been to uh, give out um, or, or give it in as many um, um, ideas and solutions to the questions that they're having uh, as possible. We're going to take these questions um, and then the answers and the, the ideas that have been suggested. Um, tonight we'll take them back, subsequently we'll have some meetings, we'll look at what was said. We are undoubtedly going to see some elements that we've not come across before. Um, we will be confirmed in some areas. We talked about principles that we think we'll have, uh, and some of the ideas will confirm those principles. But I'd be very surprised tonight if around this room, because the demographics uh, is we have some school kids here to some, uh, uh, to some uh, in the retirement community. Thank you. Awesome. Um, so I'd be really surprised if we didn't have uh, some strange things. So looking at the dependency then. Um, uh, Elka, uh, the dependency on technology is a society and entirely losing skills. So there is a, uh, a concern from Elka that as we depend on our technology to do things for us, our actual motor skills perhaps, or our physical skills could start to denude. Um, that has all sorts of implications, right? Um, if we stop doing things, we become less fit. Uh, so could the actual digital divide, the digital revolution, cause us to be less fit? Uh, Lane, considering we talk about social interaction between young children in school, how can the digital education help with social interactions for young children? Well, um, my kids have grown up, they're in the 20s, but I still see when I go to the supermarket, or I still see when I go uh, to museums, uh, three-year-olds in push chairs uh, with iPads in front of them now, uh, and they're actually connecting. I'm barely keeping up with the local, uh, the latest social networks, and as soon as I get there, my kids move on. Um, they want to move on ahead of uh, where we are, this generation. Um, so my sense is that it's the kids themselves who will be the, uh, on the bleeding edge of this subject. I was at a, a talk last year, and there was an interesting comment from a, a fairly seasoned um, a government official, and he said, you all have coaches, life coaches, it might be a, a mentor, a brother, a sister, an uncle, an aunt, a grandma. Um, who's your digital coach, and how old is your digital coach? Now, we think of coaches and mentors as being you know, uh, fairly seasoned in their ages, but surely, should our digital coach not be a 15-year-old? so that we're not left in the digital dust. There's one to consider. So we should be talking, uh, and I do to my kids. I say, don't leave me in the digital dust. Tell me about what's happening out there uh, before I see it. Uh, Jenny, thank you for your comment. Libraries are really the great equalizers in terms of access to service, uh, and I would agree. Uh, there will always be people who don't have uh, the money for these online technologies. Thanks, Jenny, for that. And you're right, uh, not everybody could possibly have the same resources. Um, however, I, I think what you'll see in the room tonight is that it's counties like Arlington's job to level the playing field by making the access to the technologies, whether it be the Wi-Fi or something yet to be uh, developed that gives us um, a leveling function. And Arlington County's job is to look at citizen access uh, into the digital divide and to bring a level common playing field. So Jenny, I think you're right. Um, you know, we don't want to further disadvantage um, part of the community because they can't afford it, 
but I also perhaps see it as an opportunity to give uh, those who are disadvantaged a leg up. We even talked about building digital. So as we build houses, as we build apartment blocks, as we build businesses, we build digital access into it. So when you buy it, you've already got it. You don't have to continue to pay for it. So Jenny, thank you very much for that. Now, um, Todd, try to find someone who can read a map. I know how to use a map and compass, but I use Google Maps to get everywhere. <laughs> well, you're right, so do I. In fact, I used it to get here today. Um, but is that a bad thing? Um, and are the days of maps um, you know, sort of gone? I, I go back to one of the Star Trek movies that I watched, where uh, Bones, uh, and I think it was Captain Spock, um, they, they beamed into a hospital to, uh, to go and rescue um, uh, one of the crew members uh, who'd been injured there. And Bones walks through the door, and he goes, these barbarians, because this guy's in intensive care. And of course, Bones just walks up with his little uh, metal thing and does this, and the guy wakes up and gets out of bed and walks away. Um, the, the difference between where we are uh, and where we're going to, we shouldn't be afraid of. Um, in the same way we left blackboards behind and chalk, in the same way we left tablets behind and chisels, should we be afraid about losing paper copies of maps behind? Sometimes we just have to let go to increase the speed to where we're going to go to. But I get your point, uh, uh, Todd, but um, when I was a kid, my parents in their glove compartment had maps, right? You'd, you'd open the glove compartment, there would be maps in there. Let me ask you online, how many of you have got maps in your glove compartment? I suspect you've already given up on the hard copy maps that you put in there. Todd, um, sorry, I'm just going to jump back down. Keep these questions coming, guys. These are great. Or, or come back at me with some of the things that I'm saying. Uh, Ilka, Elka, again, how, uh, how much tougher is it to differentiate the truth from false information out there? Well, is it any different today than it was in Benjamin Franklin's times? when it took three months, for example, for a piece of information to come across the Atlantic uh, to what was then the colonies. And you've got a Brit speaking here. Um, and oftentimes, it wasn't necessarily the, the truth that came across on those merchant ships uh, that came to Philadelphia. The official truth may have landed second. So what is the truth? I, I listened to a quote from a, gen a general uh, a couple of years ago. And he said, the truth is the first person on TV who speaks the loudest. Now, uh, some of our colleagues here said that you know, it's our job to make sure that we do due diligence. We look at um, recognized uh, articles, recognized periodicals, and we do our due diligence. But in the social media, it's speed is what happens, isn't it? We read things and we pass it on. We forward it to our friends. We, we, we cut and paste and go on. So this filtering then of, of the actuality, it's a real problem. How are we going to do that? How would you do this? Or tell me, what do you do? Do you take everything you read at face value, or do you go and look for alternative sources? Let's see what else is coming in. Thank you for these guys. These are great questions. So come up back at me at some of the stuff I'm saying. Um, <coughs> Jenny, you said that uh, letting go of the paper uh, copies of the maps um, and then getting uh, satellites um, and then aging satellite, uh, satellites stop working. Yeah, um, we could worry about technology stopping working. I would very much agree with that. Let me ask you a question, because it's one that I often get about technology stopping working. If you drive a car, how often do you worry about the steering wheel coming off? Never, right? Because the technology of the steering wheel on a car is so assured that it won't happen that we just don't think about it anymore. Well, now we're manufacturing satellites, we're manufacturing um, the digital equipment, that it's reliability, not only against wear and tear, but against failure and having backup systems is so more powerful than what it used to be that we won't worry about the steering wheel coming off in the car anymore. But I take your point, what if it does? If you remember the GPS system, the things that powers all these maps, uh, is the series of satellites up there. They may be not likely to stop working, they may be likely to be shot down if we move warfare, for example, to space. And that's another consideration about our technology. Our technology now is sometimes outside of the Earth, uh, Meteorites come in and could hit it. Um, foreign, uh, foreign countries, our enemies, could come in and take it out as well. Could they paralyze the very basis of which we're moving our lives on? It's a great question. Um, will there be a system, uh, Lane, hi, how are you? Will there be a system of governing the internet of, oh, this is a good one, I love this one. Will there be a system of governing the internet or digital information because fake news uh, keeps misleading us? Well, how do we govern um, freedom? Um, and it's, it's one of the oldest arguments. It goes back to America's founding. Um, 
the, the freedom of the press the, uh, enshrined in the Constitution. Um, do you really want to govern uh, in any way um, the ability of people to say things or will the social uh, communities themselves just walk away from sources of uh, information that are found out subsequently to be untrue. So let me give you an example. If you bought a periodical, a newspaper, and over a period of four months, you started to realize that four out of five stories in that newspaper were not true, my sense is you'd walk away from that one and you'd look for one that has a better assurity value. I don't think you need an outside agency to come in and tell you that four or five of those uh, news stories were untrue. I'm anti-regulation to that extent, but this is a great conversation because this is ethics and morals and will, will require a lot of us to do. Um, okay, let's have a look at some other. Um, uh, Jenny, uh, the relatively new problem of native advertising or sponsored content in which corporate sponsors fund articles in periodicals and exert significant control over the editorial process argues for some regulation. Yeah, Jenny, I, I think you could, you could be right, but once and again I'd go back to, and I have read in these periodicals, what I thought was a, a news piece, and then you look and you find this is an advertisement, right, uh, written down in the bottom corner. Um, and there's, there's credible people that are writing these. Um, once again, I think it would be up to you and I to walk away from these types of either social outlets, uh, social media outlets, or the physical outlets such as the newspapers uh, or the periodicals. If we don't and we're not comfortable with them, let's not buy them. And the digital speed that we move at they will see the, uh, the upswing and the downswing of the readership um, or the subscriptions immediately, and they will either regulate their own behavior or they'll go bust. Um, so if there's no profit in propagating false news, you should find that those that do will start to come down uh, as a corollary to it. Um, <coughs> looking down, Lane, thank you. Um, Lane says, this discussion is an example of our digital destiny. Since I'm at home washing dishes and making dinner, you're still able to interact and you love this. Awesome, except why are you doing it? Why isn't the robot doing it, right? Uh, why isn't this uh, robot coming around and picking stuff up? How far are we away from robots in the home? Um, coming around and just doing this stuff for you. They know, surely, um, we're not that far. I saw on the TV the other day uh, that in the United Kingdom, um, it's, the, uh, it's an anniversary of the first robot and uh, there's a museum there that's got all these robots lined up as to what was done. And if you look at the first one, to what's actually being delivered today, uh, the Honda, for example, the one that can crouch and walk and lift and go upstairs, these things have got incredible potential. So why are you doing the dishes? Get a robot. Come on, get a life on us. <clears throat> what are the biggest barriers to making your top two ideas a reality? So our top two ideas are that the information governance and the internet um, true and false, do we need to sort it out? And the other one is the impact when tech, uh, technology breaks. What's the biggest barriers to, to, to us solving this? Um, so come back with your answers on that. Um, so let's start off first with, you know, how can we solve true and false information? Uh, do we need governance bodies put in place? Uh, do we need the information police, for example, to now be coming out uh, and vetting what's gone? Is that what we're looking for? So how do we solve, if it is a problem, and we believe it is, and Lord knows in the last four months, we've seen a lot of false news, right? Or we think we've seen false news. Um, what's the solution uh, to that? So what do you say online? Come up. Um, the digital revolution creates new jobs on more entrepreneurs. Yes, it does, Leanne, you're right. Uh, and that's what should happen. It's those that, my fear um, from a, a technologist perspective is that if we, if we want to anchor ourselves to the present, we will never move on to the future. So you don't get chapter seven in a book by rereading chapter six. You just have to keep going. Now, we've already seen in things like uh, traditional engineering companies, uh, mining companies for coal, for example, steel. The products and, uh, that they're producing are no longer required in the volume that they were. Yet, in certain areas of this country and in certain areas in Europe and other countries, we're still trying to maintain that infrastructure actually for a market that doesn't exist instead of taking charge and retraining the workforce for what the future is so that we can position in them. So. Uh, the biggest barriers to making our top two ideas a reality. Come up then, guys. Um, let's talk with information. Give me a, a biggest barrier for uh, the information police. Uh, true and false. What are we looking at there? Um, what's going to either make it good or bad? Where are the barriers that you see? Alka, thanks. Uh, objective news and media companies that don't profit or lobby in any way, form, or are not affiliated or owned by major corporations. Now, there's an interesting one, right? So in Europe, uh, a company called Sky um, virtually owns everything. 
Here, of course, uh, you've got the same, uh, the same oligarchs, the Time Warners, etc. So what, um, uh, what Alka is saying is that we need to divorce um, major corporations uh, from uh, the publication of uh, news articles um, so that they don't profit or lobby in selling false news. Um, is that a regulator then? Are we looking at appointing a regulator? Or once again, are we going to the information police? Or would you prefer that you know, if, you, if you try a banana and you don't like it, you don't buy anymore? Uh, so in the same way, if you read a newspaper or a periodical and you don't like it or subsequently you've been, uh, it's understood that uh, they told lies, that knowingly told lies, to further the profits of a major corporation, would we not just buy it anymore? So, you know, where's the business value for that corporation in that? Because the profit margin would only be, it would only last for a short period of time, I suspect, but you make a great point. Um, what else have we got, guys? Keep coming in. Uh, Jenny, you said you agree with Elka um, that you know, this disassociation of media companies um, from the truth is, is something that you're looking at. Um, so how did they do that in, in America and, and, and in Europe? We have, for example, our publicly funded um, NPR, um, the BBC, for example, uh, where I come from in England, uh, and around the world there are uh, publicly funded organizations uh, who deal in objectivity uh, and um, very much like Gartner does, we don't have a dog in the fight other than to find the truth uh, and to say the good stuff and to say the bad stuff because we, want, we need you to make the choice. The choice that you're making is uh, a social choice or a purchasing choice. Um, so great point there that we may do this. Um, Todd, false news has been around for decades, if not centuries. Uh, think the National Enquirer. <laughs> yeah, uh, still, people still buy it, right? Um, so how interesting is that? That you know, when I look at the front page of the National Enquirer, I suspect that much of it is not true. I can't prove it. Um, but people still are buying it. Um, and actually, if you go back to the American Revolution, one of my pet subjects is actually the American Revolution. Um, if you look at what Jefferson um, uh, was doing, what Adams was doing um, with some of the periodicals, which they started themselves, by the way. They had printing presses, right? Uh, Adams did. Um, they were basically printing their own propaganda, or they were paying people, Thomas Paine, to print certain articles for them. So you're right, this is not new, and neither will it be new in 5, 10, 15 years. The way that it manifests itself will be new, uh, and that's what we've got to take a look out for. Um, so, NPR's objective, ha, Todd says. <laughs> hey, to me, that's where I'll go first, and then, but what I do, and I must tell you, this is how I do it, I'll sample around. Um, I've got three or four places that I go, and they do contradict each other often. So let's, reliability of technology, guys. What we got? Technology makes it very easy to spread false news. Oh, so the technology makes it easy to spread false news. So if you uh, knock out the technology, you knock out the false news. I guess that's one way of looking at it. Um, so we could have uh, false technology missiles, right, uh, aimed at these uh, satellites that beam it around. Um, that's an interesting twist to the story there. Um, so we're going to have to wrap this up fairly shortly, team. Throw me a couple more on technology. What are the barriers? The table's coming together on the floor. In fact, we're going to hand over the microphone now to our moderator. And uh, she'll walk around. When it's, when it's our turn to talk, um, I'll talk to the points you've made. Keep talking to me uh, on here, though, and I'll read your comments. I'm looking for what are the challenges with the reliability of technology, or what are our opportunities? So we've chosen the reliability of technology as a concern. What can we do about it, or what are the challenges there? Um, so keep right. going, and I'm going to shut up. You keep talking, and I'll keep typing. Okay. I think you'd love to hear this, a new way of doing meetings. Uh, there are about 40 people in this room right now, and there are over two dozen people online right now. And there have been over 40 requests coming in. In fact, there are we some have crazy ideas as well online, I can tell you. Fact, no, we, you're, doing, you're doing great, guys. We had one individual, the best ideas come out of here. <laughs> one individual who said, this is a great meeting because I'm Washing the dishes? Yeah, I'm washing the dishes and I'm doing the laundry whilst I'm doing an on online digital engagement. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is why it's so extraordinary, a meeting like this. It's not just community participants coming. We have members from the school board, we have members from people from Alexandria, we have leading technology companies, we have universities. And they're all coming together equally to talk about a topic like this. So this has been fantastic, thank yep. you. So it sounds like, and it seems like there's a lot of energy in the groups and I hope all of the facilitators are happy with the comments. What I'd like to do now is go to phase two of our, share, of our event and sharing out of the things that we've heard from the panelists. So I'll turn to Diane first. And so what I'm looking for 
is your top two ideas that y'all heard and your top two barriers. And then if anybody wants to comment on it. Okay. All right. So we're all in search of community, and the more networked we are, sometimes the more fragmented we are. So working together on problems, crowdsourcing problems, working together to build community will help bring about um, a lessening of the digital divide that one of the speakers talked about further. So we kind of mixed in both identifying the good things about technology and the exciting things as well as some of the, some of the challenges like not everybody has access to Wi-Fi or broadband. One of our members talked about, wouldn't it be great if Arlington partnered with some rural communities to make sure that they have access to the same tools that we do. Hardware is often a barrier. Children who are in schools who um, are in a different income bracket and don't necessarily have the smartphone, the iPad, the cable television at home, and all the other things that a lot of other kids take for granted. So how do we leverage those resources? How do we get over the anxiety of learning? and keeping up with technology. Um, I'm, I'm still fooling around with card catalogs, so I'm way behind. But one, one member mentioned that we could leverage the, chal the uh, talents of students who are in search of resume building opportunities or want to do pro bono work or like, like technology, like to build things. We do workshops here in the library. We do tech tutoring one-on-one, -on -one, but we also have students from WNL come over and work with people uh, over a certain age who have new devices. So doing that more regularly, not just as a special event, but it's a, it's a regular part of the routine to re reduce some of the, some of the anxiety. Uh, Julia, am I li li missing anything? Uh, the challenge is we were talking a little bit about relationship building and what spending a lot of time online does to developing compassion and empathy. And all of us who text with our loved ones because we really can't stand being around them or, or because it's easier, um, we, have that, we have that relationship. But if people are spending time only online, what does that do for developing other parts of who we are as humans, both as individuals, but also individuals in relationships and community? So Sherry Turkle at MIT has done a lot of work on that over the years. So it's not necessarily a barrier, but it's certainly something to be mindful of as we place a lot of emphasis on technology and the good that it brings. There's also the other side that we have to be developing as, as well, which is the compassion and, and empathy for others. I'll stop there, yeah? Fabulous. So can, you, can you take the microphone? There's so much already pow power in Arlington, whether it's Arlington Independent Media or the half dozen or the dozens and dozens and of other nonprofits that are really trying to do good by community there. And there are massive amounts of middle school and high school and community college students and those who have gone to college and coming back that are looking to give back. And there are loads of adults who are, um, you know, they wish their own kid would have the same passion as they did would be willing to share their passions with the other generations and kids who, who are willing to, you know, tutor those who aren't as familiar with technology there. So another example is the grand, you know, the, the grandmother with the grandchild. That's where learning takes place both ways. It's, it's leveraging Arlington's rich, rich history in, you know, whether it was that WETA got its start in Arlington out of Yorktown High School 50 years ago. I mean, there's just, or, or if you look at the Hall of Fame on any of these uh, schools, we just got to make ourselves an attractive enough community where we're sharing information, then you, then you get the big boys who are w wanting to test technologies in, in the area there. It's not rocket science. Thank, thank you very much. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, some of the newfangled technologies that are out there, um, virtual reality, gaming, augmented reality, flipped classroom. But one of the, the two best ideas that we came up with were how could technology and learning paradigms help integrate various learning groups and ages. So the thought is, is taking some senior citizens and having them being able to teach to K through 12 kids and vice versa. How could we integrate different cultural groups together within the community as well to help to the different groups learn? So the thought was, what kind of technology could help with that? Um, the other idea we had was peer learning. 
So one of the examples that I just learned about today is um, how uh, there's a YouTube video series where teenagers are teaching other kids how to answer different algebra problems or calculus problems. And I thought that was a great idea. Sometimes learning from a peer makes things a lot less overwhelming, a little more conducive to understanding, et cetera. So we were thinking, so how could technology take that even a step further? Um, some of the barriers, though, when we kind of take those two ideas, um, some barriers in general we talked about with learning and technology included the need for structure still. You can't just let kids run off with an iPad and think they're going to get their PhD. Um, there's the balance of uh, the in-person and the electronic learning, and we've talked a lot about that, and I'm sure each group's talked about that. Um, lack of human interaction, and also just the displacement by technologies. What happens to teachers? What happens to the school space? What happens to, um, you know, everyone's talking about Uber, you know, Uber drivers getting displacing the taxi drivers, and then there's going to be self-driven cars displacing the Uber drivers. So we also have to think about technology and how it creates ripples of change for good and bad. So in terms of some of the barriers to um, integrating various age groups, we came up with um, that there's cultural barriers and making sure there's cultural represent representation among all different groups. So while the K through 12 learning space may have 10 different cultural groups, for example, maybe the older or elderly representation is only two or three, how do we fill in that gap and make sure that there is cultural representation across all age groups. And then making sure that the education is effective um, and that the environment is conducive. Just because you're getting a bunch of kids together with um, senior citizens doesn't mean that education's happened, doesn't mean that they're gonna learn a lot, vice versa or whatnot. So it's really making sure that it's in a conducive environment, it's in a way that um, allows the student to learn but also helps the teacher to teach. And then the peer-to-peer -peer learning. Um, the biggest issue we kind of recognize there is vetting the actual um, educational resource, making sure that that educational research is teaching the kid the correctly how to answer that algebra problem and not teaching them alternative facts or not, <laughs> or not, not being, for example, a plug behind a third party or commercial entity who's like, I kind of want to have an indirect way of selling my product, so I'm going to do it through this popular kid vlogger who talks about history. So it's, it's making sure you're managing the third party interests, that they're not taking over the educational space, but also making sure that that educational um, opportunity or video or game, et cetera, is actually going to teach something and teach something that is actually correct. Um, one of the other peer-to-peer -peer learning issues that um, is a concern for now and for the future is the negative social interactions, the bullying that can happen when you have, unfortunately, <coughs> kids in the same space. Um, hopefully that's not as big of an issue at the senior citizen level, but we know when you get groups together, things happen. Um, but one of the things we thought about, I mean, what if there was an augmented reality learning session so kids could start beating each other up before you know it instead of just calling each other names on social media? So it's being mindful of while peer-to-peer -peer could be very effective, it can also go down roads that are ineffective and socially and emotionally damaging for kids. Any other things that I missed? My awesome group. On what was just discussed? I'm hearing themes, though, just so you know, <laughs> that are consistent, which is interesting. Let's go to Tanya and the barriers. So, well, and sorry, not barriers. Yes, it is barriers, <laughs> but it is also barriers. Well, I think what's fascinating is that both of the other groups touched on a lot of we touched on a lot of what we touched on. So you might be hearing some of the same message, but one of the two things that we thought was um, most fascinating is the access. That the idea is everyone would have access to the internet. And that because of this access, it could be an equalizer. Now it won't matter where you live or whether your school is a good school or a bad school because you'll have access to the best quality education online. Maybe your teacher is you know, the top in his or her field and they're educating you via Skype from China, real time. So what does that mean in a classroom setting? That could be the equalizer. And then we started talking about barriers. So I'll kind of go 
to each one. The barrier for that is how do we teach our families who may not, who are low income or um, don't have that understanding of digital media, how to access that kind of high quality education. Because if we have that out there, but yet they don't know how to access, or they don't understand that they have access to this, then we're increasing that divide. So what does that mean as an education system? What does it mean in our school? And so we talked about maybe in the early years, we're not introducing technology to them. Rather, we're teaching them, in addition to ABCs and one, two, threes, we're teaching them, let's show you how to access quality education. Let's show you how to decide what is quality education and what is not quality education. What is propaganda education, as one of our groups presented here, and what is what we really want to learn? What is real? What is quality? Um, so that was one of the barriers. And then what does it mean for our teachers? You know, what is their new field? You know, do we really want to take away those jobs? Are they be going to become facilitators now? Are they really going to be, is the teaching education field going to be, you're now a facilitator? You have to be a master facilitator on managing four and five and six and seven year olds with this amazing instructor halfway across the world. How does that view? So that was very, very fascinating. Uh, the other thing we talked about is it will take a village to raise our families. You will have to really work together as a community to have this access to education. Um, because if we don't, we are going to increase the divides. If we don't understand how the access to, the, to this technology is going to be so prevalent and we're not using our community resources. So for instance, our libraries are now maybe data hubs. They're not a room full of books. Maybe there's a room full of book in the back for historical purposes. But really, you have access to a variety of different ways of Wi-Fi, Skyping. You know, all of a sudden, our library is 100 televisions with little workstations and headsets or you know, um, virtual reality programs. I mean, it's just the idea of, and that becomes your equalizer for the community, right? And, but then, what is the challenge with that? How do you access that? Or how, how do we manage that financially? What does it mean for our community? And does, is that going to determine, your, you know, how does that trickle into your neighborhood? So I think those are kind of where we went with some of our ideas. We touched on a lot. We really started going everywhere. So I don't know if I can cover everything. Um, I think we need to get some comments. But are there anything else that our group, we had some great conversation that you would like to point out? Great. So, so one thing that just struck me is you talked about the role of the teacher and, and that I recall, and I remember actually from, from Lisa Guernsey's book, The Tap, Click, Read, and I thought this was great. This teacher is going from being the sage on the stage to the guide on the side. Yeah. And I like that, that stuff. It was very easy to remember. <laughs> and, it, and it's also, I think, very relevant to how you're looking. Maybe the role needs to, to be looked right. at differently. And, and we need to think that way. How do we preserve our community? The one thing that destroys a community is job loss. So how do we grow with our technology while maintaining the you know, integrity of our community, of our you know, workers in our industry? How do we train our citizens to do that? And, and the other thing, just quickly, because you just reminded me, we also realize that our students are going to become the teachers. It's going to move so quickly that, they're go that we're going to have to change the culture in our families to recognize our children are going to be teaching us. So when they come home from school, they're going to be educating us on how we access the internet, on how we improve our work skills. And that's a, a change in how we view education and, and I think the world, so. Great, thank you very much. And that fits nicely into Howard. All right, <clears throat> the first art question was managing the abundance of information in the future. The need, and this is similar to group number two, the need to validate the source. Where did this come from? Who's writing this? What's their point of view? And again, we're having a national debate now about fake news or alternative facts. Where's it, where's it coming from? And I think that's really important because especially for the novice internet user, and I still consider myself in that category, who do you believe? Where does it come from? Is it real? Can I take it to the bank? I know if you had taken a Journalism 101 course, the first thing they taught you is you must have at least two sources before you publish a story. 
Do people now look for the second source? Do they even consider the second source? Or do they take the first source, no matter where it came from, as their truth? And once they take it as their truth, then it's the truth they tell everybody else. Second we wanted to talk about was similar to that, a more effective use of search engines and skill sets to use search engines. And I really think personally, when you enter the school system and start using the internet, this is what you should be taught before they allow you to hold a mouse in your hand. How do you use a search engine? What skills do you need to use a search engine? And this is kind of similar to validating sources. Where is it coming from? How did you find it? Where did you find it? And was it easy for you to find it? I remember in the old days when you had AOL dial-up and the browser that everyone used was Netscape, you sometimes had trouble with that. You had trouble manipulating that. And I remember, you know, in the middle of doing a search, you would lose your connection and you'd have to start all over again. I also remember the neat sounds it used to make. <laughs> but again, how do you use a search engine? And this should be part of the educational process before people are allowed to use the internet. How do you actually use the internet before you're told to use the facts of the internet? So, so I'd be interested, uh, Howard brings up a good point. Does the education system today have that, provide for that? You sort of taught that at some point. We do have internet safety, internet safety guidelines, but a lot of our students now are coming in, you know, pre-K with understanding how to operate a digital device. And so it's really training the parents on internet safety, but I don't know if we've thought about saying, okay, let's, let's explain to you how to use a search engine. I know there's teachers who don't allow Wikipedia as a resource. So you actually have to go out there and look for a book online and understand an excerpt, and um, you know the bibliographies now require you to cite a website, and so there are different things. But do we have a set curriculum to actually teach our students? Here is a proper way to do search engine. You know, I would have to find that out. It's a very good question. Maybe someone here knows. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> there, there is a digital. Oh, I'm sorry. There, there is a digital um, curriculum that generally is done through the libraries. Um, in conjunction with, with the teachers. Um, also, the library system provides an extensive database, um, database resources for students. So we do not expect our younger students to actually be going onto the internet. When they're doing research, we have provided um, safe um, research places for them to go to that are behind our firewalls so that they're not actually going out um, to do that. Um, we, you were talking about your encyclopedias. Well, we have those, but they're just online right. now, and just lots <laughs> of other databases. So there is um, an actual digital curriculum, and it is a state um, requirement. So. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And a question follow-up to Howard uh, and to both of you. I mean, we have structured curriculum, it, and you have to go through 12 years to get a high school degree, then you go through four years of college. But what I understand is in five, that the top five jobs in five years, nobody knows what they are. We don't know what they are. You know, it's so, are we making a mistake training in the same, mm -hmm. same things we have, or do we, do we set things? I heard some school system. You can help me. Has eliminated curriculum in terms of core classes. It's more of education. Well, I know what Virginia is doing is we're actually going through the new profile of a graduate, which is actually going through K through 12 education reform. And one of the things that they're doing is focusing on career education in addition to academic education. And the way that they're modeling it from what I understand is they're going to be looking at what are the careers in the next 10 years. So it's a moving model, it's a growing model. So right now our kindergartners coming in, we know that the next, in the next 10 years we expect cybersecurity for instance and um, you know decoding, you know, maybe those are one of our top two out of the 10. So we will model our education around getting students to be interested in what are your interests in these fields? You know, where, where is everything that we're showing you and then guiding them towards those types of education. You know, but that would change. And insofar as employment, 
finding a job, technology, yeah. it, it changes so quickly. You really have to be on the internet almost constantly mm -hmm. for lifelong education. For example, if you took a sailor that had sailed with Christopher Columbus in 1492 and put him on a clipper ship in the 1870s, he would have no trouble sailing the ship because the technology was the same. If you took a sailor from the 1970s, the 1980s, and put him or her on a modern naval ship, they'd be completely lost because the technology has changed that quickly. Anybody have anything they want to share or, or ask before I ask a couple of questions? Oh, uh, yes, Steve. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm so, so sorry. Uh, before Steve starts. <laughs> the dangers of digital. I know. Um, <laughs> before Steve starts, a, com yeah. a comment that Bryna Heifner, our uh, communications director, just made. She's watching this live. Hi, Bryna. And what she said is it's amazing. She feels that she's like, sitting around a table talking to a group of friends. Isn't that interesting? So I have by far the largest voice in this room. We have 20 people online. There's 40 people in the room. So I own 50% of this debate is, uh, is what we did. Um, so we broke the rules, and we dealt with every subject, and we arranged across it all. But we narrowed ourselves down to two. So let me talk about this. Thanks, guys, and uh, for all your contributions. So ultimately, we boiled it down to this. We're worried about the credibility of information. And you've heard about this false news. Um, the National Enquirer came up. So why is it still on the racks, then, at the supermarket if it's false news? Because uh, there's a contradiction. Uh, and then we talked about our concerns about the reliability of our technology. If the investment in the digital future needs us to let go, and we have let go, we've let go of the rotary dial and our Bakelite telephones, for those of you who remember. We've let go of the typewriter. We've let go of the sense that the steering wheel will come off the car when we're driving it. We don't even think about that anymore, right? Um, what happens if we let go completely about our concern about the reliability of the future of the planet and its reliability, the redundancy, for example. So there's where we went. So let me walk through some of the, uh, the points that the team made. Um, so in terms of the credibility, uh, the digital divide, the concern there was that um, those that can afford it will go to outlets who will guarantee to give you good news. Those that can't afford it will have to go to outlets where you take your look. So you will pay to get an assured product of good news uh, that will come through. Um, the second was sources that do not profit or lobby um, should be the only ones that are allowed to report the news. I mean, several legal, ethical, and social issues that are coming up here, as well as <laughs> constitutional uh, for this country. Um, so who will be the information police? Who will be the regulator or the ombudsman? Who had that power to do that? Sort of almost going back to the Soviet Union. Um, imposed or self-regulated? So the, the debate there was, look, if you read a, an article uh, from a periodical and after four months, it, it, it's quite clear to you that 50% of this stuff is rubbish, won't you stop buying it? So why even regulate it? It will self-regulate. That company, except the National Enquirer, will go out of uh, a business, right? Um, finally, uh, the technology makes it easy to spread false news. You've seen that, um, but uh, I forget your name. I think it was Aaron uh, made a great point. Um, in the revolution in this country, we were spreading false news. Some of the great propagandists in this country went through that period from 1776 to 1800 by deliberately leveraging false news. There's nothing new in this game, except instead of doing it with a pen and ink and a quill, we're doing it differently. Slight. So reliability, this is the big one. Everybody's concerned that we put all our future in the reliability of technology. Uh, what happens if it's taken out? Now, GPS satellites, is the future of warfare therefore not human to human? It is taking out our technology nodes. Mm -hmm. It's taking out our satellites that give us the Google Maps that got me here tonight because we held it on the cell phone and I walked that way. Um, is it the, uh, therefore, the future of warfare no longer to do with humans? Uh, this kinetic to kinetic tanks, aeroplanes, stop building them, uh, stop recruiting humans. Let's just go after the technology side of it. There's a concern. So what can we do? Redundancy. Build into everything that we do. Uh, redundancy. The trouble is with that is your costs will rise when we do this. Uh, two of everything is, is twice as much. Um, so there's a, there, there's, that, there's a conflict here on this. Um, we talked about maps, road maps. So what happens when satellites go down? How many could open their glove compartment in the car and pull out a map? Have you still got one? One, two, three. You know. Or how many have given up paper? And this was, this was the quote. 
<laughs> don't toss out the paper. Uh, that's the example that they used for the redundancy on this. Uh, so lastly, and I'm, I'm beginning it up, there was two things overall that came out as a different theme. So technology is removing our instincts, our instincts to read a map, our instincts to know where east is, our instincts to make a judgment call, because technology is doing all that for us. Technology is also changing our human form. Um, for example, uh, manual labor being removed means that muscles that we used to use are no longer used. Therefore, will the body development look differently over the course of uh, uh, a century? Uh, mouse fingers. Who's got mouse fingers? Corporal tunnel thing. That will go away because that will be the strongest thing. But what about the rest? They will weaken off. It's, it's Darwin. It's the evolution of the species. So technology actually could be responsible for <coughs> mutants. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> On that note. Yeah, are there any questions? I have a question. One question about Go ahead, this. Jack. Charlie Rose on 60 Minutes, about mm. what, January, just after the first of the year, was interviewing a robot. It was a robot right. that had the Watson brains in it, IBM mm -hmm. Watson, and it looked something like Holly mm -hmm. sitting there. No, it's I'm not standing. Yeah, right. <laughs> was, he was sitting there. And Charlie Rose said, so uh, what do you want to do? And had the, had different conversation going on. But finally he said, so what's your final goal? Right. And she looked at him and said, I want to be smarter than you someday. Mm -hmm. No, no, that's worrying, right? So what's that mean? Yeah. 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 Are we letting computers get ahead of us? Um, do you care? I don't. Ooh, silence in the room. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So before we, as we start to wrap it up. Do you have a question? I, oh, sorry. I was just going to throw in, for those who are into thinking about doomsday scenarios, there's another Arlington nonprofit in my PHRS. Oh, okay. It's called uh, uh, CERT, uh, yeah. um, Community Emergency Response yeah. Volunteers. It's a great organization, and they're going to be doing another class this spring. So we want to make sure we're, we're wrapping it up. Oh, yep, yep, sorry. I just want to add, uh, to jump back to what Tanya and Howard were uh, referring to about we don't know what the next key jobs are going to be. The important thing to do, though, is to look into whether it's cybersecurity or another occupation and realize that the fundamental skills of critical thinking, ability to communicate, ability to work in a team, creative thinking, those are what we need to emphasize, particularly in K-12, and build student, build student futures that way. That's an excellent point. Thank you. Anybody else? Howard, do you want to say something? Yeah, real quickly, just to add to what you said. When we, we talk to employers, the skill sets they're looking for the most are the personal skills. They, can, they all say, we can ultimately teach you technical skills, but we can't teach you social skills. How to be a nice person, how to be honest, how to come to work on time. So those are the real skills, aside from the internet skills. I think we are about out of time. I right. want to thank everybody who is in the room and who is not in the room for participating. I think it sounded like a fabulous conversation. I think there were a lot of great things that were brought up. There were some things that did not surprise me. I think the, the concept of diversity and being inclusive is very consistent with things I've always heard within Arlington County. The thought of looking at things differently, the thought of making sure that we're considering from an employment perspective. I think we have a great potential to build on in our next Digital Destiny event. We talked about a little bit, um, some things related to it. It's on wellness, and it's going to be about aging in place. So some of the lifelong learning aspects could be incorporated into that. And we're planning on doing that sometime in the spring. So I hope you will be interested. And if you can't be here in person, you can be here online. Thank you very much. <laughs>